Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Mike Solomon, the Dean of the Graduate School. It's really my pleasure to welcome you to uh, today's event, which is a hybrid event. So it's happy. I'm delighted to welcome you, those that are here in the room, as well as those that are joining uh, us virtually. Uh, this is a very special event. This is the Henry Awards uh, Program and Lecture. It's a special event in the university's calendar. Today we honor a colleague with the highest distinction the institution can bestow, the Russell Lectureship. The two 2022 Henry Russell Lecture is Donald Kinder, whom Provost Collins will introduce to you shortly. To begin, I would like to share the history about the namesake for the Russell Award. Henry Russell earned three degrees from the University of Michigan, a Bachelor of Arts degree in 1873, a law degree in 1875, and then a master's of arts degree in 1876. Russell was born in Detroit and remained in Michigan after graduation, where he was a successful lawyer and pro prosperous in business. He was involved in the Michigan Central Railroad, the Michigan State Telephone Company, Union Trust Company, People's State Bank, and the Detroit, uh, Detroit Steel Products Company. He was the type of entrepreneurial graduate of the University of Michigan that our state values. In February of 1920, while in New York City, Russell took ill and died at age 67 from pneumonia, just as he was preparing to travel to Europe to claim his son's body. His son, Lieutenant, Lieutenant William M. Russell, was killed in aerial combat during World War I. In his will, Henry Russell left the University of Michigan a $10,000 bequest to create an endowment fund his one stipulation was that the income from the endowment should be used for additional compensation to members of the instructional staff. In May of 1925, the Regents established the Henry Russell Lecture as a way to recognize a senior member of the faculty with an honorarium of $250 funded by Russell's endowment. In addition, $250 was dedicated for an additional award to honor a faculty member below the rank of professor for conspicuous service to the university. Although the funds from Russell's bequest have long ago run out, the university continues this honor of its most accomplished faculty with the award in his name. So I'm honored to be involved in today's ceremony to, reconcile, uh, to recognize our outstanding faculty members. I'd like to invite Provost Susan Collins to present the Henry Russell Awards to our four faculty members. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Um, I'm just delighted to be here as well. I have to say, um, this has always been one of my very favorite events, and uh, it's just a pleasure to be able to recognize some of our most accomplished faculty. Uh, and so to begin, it is my pleasure to invite Professor Shanna Daly to come forward as I read the citation. Shanna Daly a leading scholar in mechanical engineering design and engineering education focuses on how engineering conceptualizes, teaches, and values skills needed to design for a complex world. She was part of an interdisciplinary team that developed the Design Heuristics Tool, a widely used collection of strategies to support design ideation. Professor Daly co-founded U of M Center for Socially Engaged Design and was a co-director of the Design and Engineering Education Division of the American Society of, Edu of Engineering Education. She serves on the International Journal of Mechanical Engineering Education Editorial Board and is a recipient of the National Science Foundation Career Award, the Monroe Brown Foundation Education Excellence Award, and the U of M Women in Science and Engineering Willie Hobbs Moore Achievement Award. In recognition of her success in redefining crucial engineering skill sets through her research, teaching, and service, the University of Michigan is pleased to honor Professor Shanna Daly with the Henry Russell Award. Congratulations. Will Professor Roshanik Midipana please join me at the lectern?
urban health equity scholar Roshana Madipanek studies the effects of socioeconomic conditions, the built environment, and government policies on the health of residents and communities. She contributes to influential reports, including the World Health Organization's first global report on urban health. Professor Medipana is co-lead of a new School of Public Health initiative, Public Health Ideas for Creating Healthy and Equitable Cities. It examines how housing policies impact health inequities in cities. And she has worked with various community-based organizations, including the United Community Housing Coalition, which presented its Academic Partner of the Year Award to her for her leadership in improving access to poverty tax exemptions in Detroit. She also publishes in prominent journals and has spearheaded development of new U of M courses focused on urban health. Professor Meripana, in recognition of your scholarly contributions, teaching, and service, the University of Michigan is pleased to present you the Henry Russell Award. Congratulations. <laughs> Will Professor Tiffany Ng please join me at the lectern? University of Michigan Carolinist Tiffany Ng is internationally recognized for her artistry and commitment to reimagining, enlarging, and diversifying the Carolin repertoire. She has commissioned and premiered scores of work for Carolin by black and Native American composers and electroacoustic pieces by women. Professor Ng, a gifted teacher and generous collaborator, has performed in Asia, Australia, throughout Europe, and North America. Her eclectic performances on the universities Charles Baird and Anne and Robert Lurie Carillons enrich Ann Arbor's soundscape, delighting students, community residents, and visitors. Her music is featured on several albums. She's also a prolific scholar and author and has created influential reference resources about Carillon music created by African Americans and women, transgender and non-binary composers. Professor Ng, in recognition of your contributions to the Carillon repertoire, your teaching and your service, the University of Michigan is honored to present you the Henry Russell Award. Congratulations. <laughs> Will Professor Lakeisha Simmons please join me at the lectern? Historian Lakeisha Simmons is one of the nation's top scholars of race and gender. She has opened new understandings of the histories of African American girls and women in the 20th century through her groundbreaking research in the long neglected field of black girlhood studies. Professor Simmons' landmark book, Crescent City Girls, The Lives of Young Black Women in Segregated New Orleans, won the Julia Cherry Spruill Book Prize for the best book in Southern women's history from the Southern Association of Women Historians. She co-edited a special issue of Women, Gender, and Families of Color dedicated to black girlhood and serves on the Journal of American History editorial board. A dedicated teacher and mentor, Professor Simmons receives the University of Michigan's Cornerstone Award in 2019 for her work with African American students. Professor Simmons, in recognition of your exceptional scholarship, teaching, and service, the University of Michigan is honored to present you the Henry Russell Award. I now invite Professor Donald Kinder to come forward while I read the citation. Donald Kinder is one of the nation's most influential political scientists and a pioneer in the field of race and politics. 
He has reshaped political science with his theories and empirical methods and has enhanced understanding of how voters evaluate candidates, parties, and government. Professor Kinder led the American National Election Studies as co-principal investigator for 14 years. He has co-authored six books, including News That Matters, Divided by Color, and Us Against Them, and has authored some 50 book chapters and journal articles. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Sciences, and received the American Political Science Association Warren E. Miller Prize for his accomplishments and service to the field of elections, public opinion, and voting behavior. Professor Kinder, in recognition of your transformative contributions to political science, leadership, and mentoring, the University of Michigan is truly honored to present you with the Henry Russell Lectureship. Congratulations. So please join me in welcoming the 2022 Henry Russell Lecture, Donald Kinder, who will speak on Myrdal's prediction, prejudice, and principles in American political life. And I know we're all looking forward to this lecture. I certainly have been for some time. Perfect, welcome. happening okay thank you I realize uh, when I attend lectures like these and I'm sitting out in the audience with you by the way it's very nice to see some of your faces today uh, I realize that I oftentimes grow impatient with the extravagance of the introduction but today I, I kind of liked it uh, I want to start today, perhaps unconventionally, by uh, giving thanks. Uh, first to my mother. When I was a boy, my mother would drive me again and again to our town's public library. And on the way there and on the way back, she would try to convince me that books were more important than baseball. She failed, of course, but she made a few good points. I actually think her heart wasn't altogether in it. I also want to thank David Sears, my first and most important teacher. Over the years, David has been uh, relentlessly generous and gracious to me. And uh, he has many attributes, but that's the one I admire the most. And he's actually even generous and fair-minded to his critics something I admire, but which I have not been able to incorporate into my own practice yet. Uh, to Janet Weiss, in-house editor and therapist, intellectual powerhouse, the wisest and best person I know. And finally, to the university, excellent and conscientious staff, inspiring undergraduates, brilliant graduate students, Splendid colleagues, too many to name, some of whom are here. I'm skipping over the bad parts. It's an extraordinary place, and I know how lucky I am. So now let's turn to the lecture proper, um, Myrdal's prediction, Prejudice and Principles in American Political Life. This Myrdal I refer to in the title is Gunnar Myrdal. Some of you will know him. He was a citizen of Sweden a brilliant, if iconoclastic, economist and a principal architect of the Swedish welfare state. In the summer of 1937, the Carnegie Corporation of New York invited Myrdal to undertake a comprehensive study of what Carnegie called the Negro problem in the United States. After some hesitation, Myrdal knew nothing of race in America. He accepted the invitation, moved his family to New York, and in time brought forth an extraordinary work of social science. His book was An American Dilemma, The Negro Problem and Modern Democracy, and was published in 1944. It was a prodigious work, 45 chapters, 1,000 pages of text, nearly a dozen appendices. It was a prodigious work and an important one. 
Myrdal's report influenced a generation of activists and academics, lawyers and judges, policymakers, and presidents. The dilemma that Myrdal claimed to discover at the core of the American problem of race arose out of the glaring contradiction between democratic ideals and racial discrimination. White Americans were caught in a dilemma, according to Muradal, suspended between their commitments to noble democratic principles, especially the idea of equality, what Muradal called the American creed on the one side, and their acceptance of race prejudice on the other. In the struggle between the two, between principles and prejudice, Muradal was certain that the former would prevail. The American creed's advance was inexorable. Racism's days were numbered. Intermittently over the years, I have tried to bring evidence and precision to Muradal's sweeping claims, to sharpen their implications and test them empirically. To do so, I have relied primarily on statistical analysis of sample surveys. I analyze what Americans from all walks of life, young and old, rich and poor, urban and rural, have to say about race, politics, and life in the United States. This is not the only way to grapple with Muradal's subject, but it is, I think, a useful way. In any case, it's my way, and it's my lecture. <laughs> this afternoon, I'm going to talk briefly about three important episodes presented as illustrations of what I've been up to. First, the emergence of a new form of racism, unanticipated by Muradal, arising out of the racial crisis of the 1960s. Second, the statewide campaign to prohibit affirmative action at the University of Michigan in 2006. And third, the still astonishing rise to power of Donald Trump in 2016. So first, the new racism. In America, racism emerged in complete form as a justification for slavery. When slavery came under attack by abolitionists in the early decades of the 19th century, the leading lights of the South rose in defense. They insisted that slavery was a just and virtuous institution and that Africans were fit for slavery and for slavery alone. The debate over slavery, culminating in a horrendous civil war, transformed what had been a mostly unthinking assumption of racial superiority into a self-conscious theory of racism, what I will call biological racism, a theory of racial difference grounded in what were taken to be the facts of nature. And what were these facts? They're presented for you in the first slide. You can read through them. I want to draw special attention to the second one there, which is really the core of the matter, that differences between races in intellectual capacity and moral character were obvious, categorical, inborn, and permanent. Racism is both belief and emotion, and what you can see on the last line of the slide is that the emotional signature of biological racism was contempt or disgust. The Civil War brought an end to slavery, but other forms of racial oppression survived and still more were invented. For this, biological racism provided justification and insofar as it was needed, moral consolation. The biological form of racism persisted well into the 20th century, endorsed not just by ordinary citizens, but by scientists, intellectuals, church leaders, and statesmen alike, both South and North. This is no longer so. From World War II to the present, support for biological racism has undergone a slow, gradual, and steady decline, as you see in the next slide, which summarizes uh, results from uh, national surveys undertaken by the University of, the University of Chicago from 1977 to about now, on a single indicator, but a very good indicator of biological racism. And what you can see there is that biological racism has not disappeared, but it has substantially diminished. The change you can see in the slide is due largely to generational replacement, not for the most part to individuals changing their mind, but rather to turnover in the population. Elderly generations of whites in possession of old-fashioned beliefs about race have been gradually replaced by younger, better educated generations, more likely than their elders to reject the claim of innate biological categorical difference. 
In the social sciences, general, generational replacement has sometimes been referred to as social progress through death. The example, the example before us here, the decline of biological racism, is an excellent case in point. The decline, as you see up on the slide, is also uh, broadly consistent with Muradal's prediction. But the decline has been much slower and less complete than Muradal had imagined. And even if biological racism were to disappear completely, which it has not, it would not mean the end of racism. Much as biological racism emerged out of the 19th century debate over slavery, a new modern variety of racism arose out of the racial crisis of the 20th century. Or so I and others have argued. This racial crisis of the 20th century was set in motion by the rising of the civil rights movement. It began humbly as protests against second-class citizenship in a handful of southern towns. By the end, its achievements were historic, transformational. In the space of a dozen years, segregation of public schools was ruled unconstitutional, discrimination on account of race and employment was made illegal, voting rights were reinstated, discrimination in housing was prohibited, a war was declared on poverty, social programs launched and expanded, Black Americans were being appointed for the first time in American history to high public office, to the cabinet, and even to the Supreme Court. Taken together, a profound and highly visible shift in the priorities of the national government had taken place. For a moment at least, the presidency, the Congress, and the courts appeared to be aligned in a concerted effort to improve the lives of black Americans. This was the 20th century liberal experiment on race. Some called it a second reconstruction. And then what? In August of 1965, less than a week after President Johnson signed the voting rights bill into law across the country in a black neighborhood in Los Angeles, Marquette Fry was pulled over by a California Highway Patrol officer. The officer was white, charged Frey, a young black man, with reckless driving and administered a sobriety test. Fry failed the test and was placed under arrest. Meanwhile, a crowd gathered, insults were exchanged, pushing and shoving commenced, additional patrol cars arrived, guns were drawn, more arrests were made. The uprising in Watts had begun. It lasted nearly a week. Before the violence could be halted, 14,000 14, National Guard troops were pressed into service. Roughly 1,000 buildings were damaged, destroyed, looted, burned. Almost 4,000 people were arrested. More than 1,000 were injured seriously enough to require medical treatment. 34 were dead. And Watts, of course, was just the beginning. In the summers that followed came major disorders in Chicago, New York, Detroit, Atlanta, Washington, and in scores of other cities, large and small, in every part of the country. So here's the crux of the matter, at least as I see it, during this tumultuous period many white Americans came to believe two things simultaneously. One, that their national government had undertaken a massive and expensive effort to improve the position of black people in American society. And two, that black Americans had responded to these gifts, not with gratitude, but with violence and disorder on an epic scale. Out of this came a new defense of the racial status quo a new theory of racial difference, what I will call modern racism. The basic elements of modern racism are shown in the next slide. The first insists or presumes that the problem of race is cultural, that blacks have cre created communities in which violence, idleness, crime, drug abuse, broken families, and neglected children are the norm. A second, that discrimination no longer stands in the way of black Americans realizing the good life. Discrimination had been eradicated. Third, fraudulent assertion of victimization, that blacks spend too much time complaining about their problems and demanding special treatment. And uh, fourthly, and ironically, racial injustice, that government and other major institutions have showered blacks with advantages that they have not earned and do not deserve. Such arrangements and practices are an affront to those white Americans who work hard, stay sober, support their children, and quietly earn their way. 
the emotional signature of this new racism is anger and resentment, replacing disgust and contempt that had been associated with biological racism. The principal difference between these two varieties of racism, biological and modern, old and new, concern how racial differences are understood. Biological racism takes differences between blacks and whites to be biologically determined, and therefore, at least in everyday understanding, permanent. Racial differences are deep and unalterable. On the account offered by the new racism, blacks do poorly not because of their biological endowments, but because of, their poor cho because of the poor choices they make and the dysfunctional culture they create. Racial difference has more to do with culture than biology, seen in the customs and folkways of black life. Idleness, violence, drug abuse, crime, the whole tangle of pathology that many whites see as characteristic of life in black neighborhoods. Modern racism provides justification not for slavery or discrimination or segregation, not for keeping blacks in their place, but for neglect. No more favored treatment, no more special rights, no more unfair advantages, no reparations for the sins of the distant past. Many whites came to say, in effect, we've done enough, we've done too much. Capturing such sentiments, developing reliable measures of the new racism is tricky business. Measurement is always tricky business. Uh, I could go on at some length about measurement. I see my colleagues beginning to groan. Uh, I, I have no interest in doing that, uh, so I won't. But let me just say now, assert boldly that by aggregating responses to questions of the sort that you see here, in the first case, Irish, Italian, Jews, and many other minorities overcame prejudice and worked their way up. Blacks should do the same without any special favors. By aggregating responses to propositions like those shown on the slide, it is possible to build a reliable scale of modern racism. The scale allows us to distinguish with considerable precision between whites who are generally sympathetic towards blacks from those who are generally unsympathetic, who resent the failure of blacks as they see it to demonstrate the virtues of self-reliance and hard work. Uh, measurement is absolutely indispensable to the work of science, and I don't really feel entirely comfortable skipping over it, uh, but, but we invest in measurement so that the tools we create can tell us something important about political life. And with that in mind, I want to turn to the political struggle of over affirmative action as it played out at the University of Michigan. Uh, affirmative action is a, is a really interesting and important case for me, in, in part because it has been for some time the center of political conflict over matters of race in America, but also because opponents of affirmative action, judges, intellectuals, pundits, elected officials, have argued that the policy stands as a repudiation of what the civil rights movement was calling for. Instead of removing race from public and private decisions, affirmative action seemed to return race to the center of things. They argued further that opposition to affirmative action in the general public has little to do now with race or racism, that it is a matter of interests and principles and partisanship, not racism. Politics as usual, you could say. So let's take a look and do so by examining a case close to home. This story begins in 2003 when in the spring of that year, for the first time in a generation, the Supreme Court heard arguments over affirmative action in university admissions. In a pair of cases, white students denied admission to the University of Michigan's undergradu undergraduate college and the law school sued the university, arguing that the affirmative action procedures in the university's admissions violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. The university argued in defense that its admission policies were narrowly tailored and that they were in the service of advancing the state's compelling interest in racial diversity and educational environments. Microsoft, General Motors, IBM, and scores of other major companies urged the court to uphold the university's admissions plans. So did a group of decorated military leaders who argued that affirmative action was indispensable 
to the creation of an effective fighting force. As things turned out, by a vote of six to three, the court declared the university's undergraduate policy unconstitutional. Race can be taken into account, the court reasoned, but it cannot be a decisive factor. At the same time, by a vote of five to four, the court ruled in favor of the law school's policy, concluding that the law school's narrowly admission use of race was compatible with the Constitution and the Equal Protection Clause. A split decision. Two weeks after the court issued its rulings, Ward Connerly came to Ann Arbor. Connerly was a successful African-American businessman and a forceful critic of affirmative action. Connerly announced his intention to compel the state of Michigan to end affirmative action altogether. He spoke to a group of students in Hatcher, uh, in front of Hatcher Library, which is just a little ways over there. Connerly's organization collected the required number of signatures and thereby succeeded in placing what he called the Michigan Civil Rights Initiative on the ballot in November of 2006. The Michigan Civil Rights Initiative, that's what Connerly called it in a clever bit of framing. I will call it by its official and neutral name, Proposal 2. Proposal 2 stipulated that neither the state nor any public school shall discriminate against or grant preferential treatment to any individual or group on the basis of race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin. The proposal was opposed by state political leaders, Democrat and Republican alike. It was opposed by business leaders. It was opposed by labor leaders, opponents, outspent Connolly's group by a large margin. Nevertheless, come November, Proposal 2 passed handily, winning nearly 60% of the vote. In the state of Michigan, through democratic process, affirmative action had become illegal. As this campaign was getting underway, Nancy Burns and I carried out a survey on a representative sample of voting age citizens in the state of Michigan. We conducted interviews both before and then after the election, asking people lots of things, including a standard measure of modern racism. Among other things, we found uh, that, this is not very surprising, in one respect, we found that whites voted decisively in favor of Proposal 2, while blacks voted overwhelmingly against it. According to our survey, 65% of whites, but only 14% of blacks, reported that they had voted to eliminate affirmative action. This is a huge racial difference of more than 50 percentage points. It's not surprising that blacks and whites differ over Proposal 2. Blacks and whites almost always differ over racial matters. They always differ substantially over affirmative action. What's noteworthy here is the magnitude of the difference. The racial difference over Proposal 2 was exceptionally large. Second, and something that speaks directly to Muradal's prediction, our analysis of the vote returned one major finding, a very large effect of modern racism on the white vote. A large effect of modern racism holding constant the effects due to other factors, including partisanship and political principles. How large an effect is shown in this slide. Uh, along the horizontal axis here is a measure of modern racism, or sometimes called racial resentment, from sympathetic on the left to resentful on the right. The vertical axis is the probability of voting in favor of Proposal 2. And what you can see in the figure is how sharply the curve ascends as racism increases. That whites who were relatively sympathetic to blacks voted decisively against Proposal 2, while those who were racially resentful in their sentiments towards blacks voted overwhelmingly for it. The problem from the point of view of the opponents of Proposal 2 is that white voters in Michigan were much more likely to be over here than they were to be over here. Uh, one more thing I want to mention uh, about uh, affirmative action in Michigan. Burns and I developed and designed a second survey parallel to our Michigan study and carried out simultaneously, this time in the country as a whole. 
Interviews were taken before and after the election, just as before. We used the same instrumentation, the same measure of modern racism. Everything essentially was the same, except that in the national survey, we were asked, we asked respondents whether they would, be, would have supported or opposed a hypothetical initiative that we worded as closely as possible to parallel proposal two. The animating idea here was to put ourselves in a position to compare Michigan voters to voters elsewhere in the country who went about their business on election day without benefit, so to speak, of an expensive, contentious, and year-long campaign. It turned out that the hypothetical version of Proposal 2 posed to the national sample also produced a large racial divide, though not as large as the racial divide generated by Proposal 2 in Michigan. And likewise, it turned out that while modern racism predicted white opposition to the hypothetical version of Proposal 2, the effect of modern racism was significantly less in the national sample than among Michigan voters. Still important to be sure, but less important than in Michigan and the real vote on affirmative action. Now these differences between Michigan voters and, the, and voters in the country in, as a whole, between how voters think about affirmative action when treated with a campaign versus not, can be interpreted in several different ways. But to me, they suggest something troubling about an essential democratic procedure. Campaigns are supposed to help voters discover how their interests and aspirations map onto the choices they face in the present case to determine whether they should vote for or against Proposal 2. Arguably, Proposal 2 campaign succeeded in this way. But after the campaign notice, Michigan voters were divided more by race than they otherwise would have been, and motivated more by racism than they otherwise would have been. The story of Proposal 2 did not end with a vote in Michigan. A month after Proposal 2 passed, a suit was filed challenging the vote. The case wound its way through the courts. Finally, in 2014, the Supreme Court concluded the litigation by finding that the amendment banning affirmative action in Michigan was constitutionally permissible. In my view, the High Court's decision was accompanied by some sentimental claptrap from Justice Kennedy on the glory of democracy. In Kennedy's view, campaigns provide citizens with the opportunity to learn, study, rationally and respectfully debate, and then finally, and I'm quoting now, through the political process, act in concert to shape the course of a nation that must strive always to make freedom ever greater and more secure. All I can say to that is that the campaign to abolish affirmative action in Michigan sure looked different to me on the ground here in Ann Arbor than it did to Justice Kennedy in his chambers in Washington. Uh, which brings me uh, finally to Donald Trump. You all remember him. In November of 2016, after eight years of Barack Obama, the American electorate turned to Trump. Almost nobody saw this coming, perhaps not even Trump himself. What did race and racism have to do with Trump's shocking success? The answer to this question was not obvious, at least to me it wasn't, when I started in on this question. And here's why. For one thing, Trump's election generated a number of plausible sounding explanations that have nothing to do with race. Explanations that emphasize globalization, economic dislocation, the legitimate grievances of the white working class, explanations, in short, that privilege class over race, material interests over racial resentments. For another, if we were to go back and take a close look at the 2016 campaign, we would discover that Trump actually had relatively little to say on the subject of race. Consider this summary of the Trump campaign. I know this is too much text, uh, but it's very high-grade text. I wish I had written it. I didn't. Robert Kagan did of the Brookings Institution. As a, and I think it's a splendid summary of, of the Trump campaign. According to Kagan, what Trump has to say provokes and plays upon feelings of resentment and disdain intermingled with bits of fear, hatred, and anger. anger. His public discourse consists of attacking or ridiculing a wide range of others whom he depicts either as threats or as objects of derision. I, I think he captures a lot of what Trump had to say. And notice, this is the important thing for the, 
for the purpose of uh, what I'm about to say now is that Kagan doesn't mention blacks, right? His, his list does not include blacks. Trump's poisonous anger and contempt was limited, if limited is the right word, which it is not, to, as Kagan wrote, Muslims, Hispanics, women, Chinese, Mexicans, Europeans, Arabs, immigrants, and refugees. During the campaign, Trump spoke little about what Miradal and the Carnegie Corporation referred to as the Negro problem. On the other hand, if we look beyond the campaign itself, the picture changes. Trump came to political prominence, how? By, attack, by attacking Obama, the nation's first black president. So a quick reminder, Trump was the most prominent figure in the birther movement, which challenged Obama's citizenship. He parlayed baseless, baseless claims over where Obama was born into equally unfounded speculations about the president's faith in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary, Trump continued to feed the suspicion that Obama was not Christian, but rather Muslim, and that because of his faith, Obama was soft on ISIS. Trump demanded that Obama turn over his college grades because Obama, of course, was not smart enough to get into an Ivy League university. He floated the idea that Obama's critically acclaimed memoir, Dreams from My Father, had been ghostwritten. On and on it went. According to Trump, Obama was a know-nothing, a disaster, the worst president in American history. So there was that. And we should also notice that not only for Trump, but for Trump especially, the 2016 election took place in the shadow of the Obama presidency. That's my grandson. He disagreed with that. Trump's political views do not uh, fit neatly into standard ideological categories. He's hard to classify. This leads sometimes to the conclusion that Trump has no real, real ideology. Tanahashi Coates says this is a mistake. Trump does possess an ideology, white supremacy in all its truculent and sanctimonious power. In Coates' analysis, Trump became the political beneficiary of white American backlash against the humiliation suffered by living in a country presided over by a black man, a country that they had thought belonged to them. By replacing Obama and reversing his policies, by making the country great again, Trump offered white Americans, some white Americans, the possibility of redemption. So with arguments on both sides, what does the evidence reveal about the place of race and racism in Trump's success? I'm going to concentrate my remarks here on, not on the general election of 2016, maybe to your surprise, but on the Republican primary that preceded it, that is, on Trump's successful capture of the Republican nomination. I think this is actually a more remarkable and perhaps even more important part of the Trump story. I can say more about that later on if you're interested. You may remember Trump's nomination campaign got off to a rocky start from his famous announcement in June of 2015, you may remember this, Trump coming down a golden escalator in his uh, uh, luxurious building on Fifth Avenue in, in New York to an adoring and largely paid for crowd. You may remember that. From that point of June of 2015 all the way to the Iowa caucus in February of the following year, Trump received not a single endorsement from a prominent member of his party, not one. Moreover, he raised little money, put together no real field operation, and assembled at best a ramshackle and inept campaign staff. Nevertheless, as we know, Trump won the Republican Party nomination, and he won it going away. Running against a formidable and crowded field, how did Trump manage to secure the Republican Party nomination? This is uh, a story with more than one cause. The list of possible causes include, I think, the Republican Party failing to coordinate on a candidate or two who could actually take on Trump, and certainly it includes Trump's masterful command of the airwaves. I want to offer uh, quickly a complementary perspective to these explanations, looking at the Republican nomination context through the lens of race. From this perspective, a first point that comes clearly into view is this. The current version of the Republican nomination process takes place with almost no black participation. 
Of the 17 announced candidates for the Republican presidential nomination in 2016, only one, Ben Carson, was African American. It is even more so with the voters. According to exit polls in 2016, blacks made up on average just 3% of the Republican primary electorate. At, camp, at Trump campaign's events, particularly African Americans were especially rare. At a rally in Redding, California, Mr. Trump spotted a black man in the crowd, pointed him out, interrupted his speech, and said to the rest of those in attendance, oh, look at my African American over here. Look at him, are you the greatest? I think that's a rhetorical question. Trump, particularly, and other Republican candidates more generally, were competing for votes before audiences that were nearly all white. This is not a healthy arrangement. We know that such audiences, that is racially homogeneous audiences, encourage racial resentment, sorry, racial extremism from those who seek their support. A second point, modern racism powerfully predicts white Republican support for Trump. You can see this in the next slide. This is rather like the slide we saw before. Along the horizontal axis is the modern racism scale going again from racially sympathetic on the left-hand side to racially resentful on the right-hand side. The vertical axis this time is the likelihood, the probability, expected probability of a vote for Trump among Republican, white Republicans during the nomination season. And what you can see there is Trump was, in, sorry, that uh, modern racism was important to Trump's support. What, drew, what drove white support for Trump, what primarily distinguished Trump voters from those Republican voters who preferred Rubio or Bush or Fiorina or Cruz was racism. Racism, not other things, not for the most part economic grievances, not political principles, not even opposition to immigration. A third and final and really more general point about 2016. As I have already mentioned, the Republican electorate is overwhelmingly white. More precisely, overwhelmingly non-black. The American party system is deeply divided by race. It's divided by race more now than in any time since FDR. On top of that, we must now add on an additional condition. The American party system is also divided by racism. 30 years ago, white Republicans, white Democrats were indistinguishable in their racial sentiments. This is no longer true. What I have called modern racism is much more popular now in Republican circles than in Democratic ones. The two populations overlap, of course, but the difference between white Republicans and white Democrats on modern racism is large and it appears to be increasing. These political divides by race and by racism are not the only cause of the partisan polarization that currently infects our politics, but they contribute to polarization in a major way. And polarization in extreme form is the enemy of democracy. Polarization undermines social cohesion, increases animosity, and turns ordinary disagreements into implacable conflicts. One last thing, and for this, I return to where I began, to Muradal. I don't want to leave the impression that I think Muradal was mistaken all the way through. He's not. An American Dilemma is a great book. It's crammed with valuable information and brimming with insight. I do think Muradal underestimated the importance and tenacity of racism in our politics. But he got many things right, and I want to close with one. In forceful language, Muradal insisted that race posed a fundamental test for American democracy. Muradal was writing at a dark time, in the midst of a ravaging economic depression and on the edge of a horrific world war. But he was right, I think, to claim that coming to terms with race was one of our nation's greatest challenges. Muradal was right to claim that then. And notwithstanding the substantial progress made since his time, Muradal remains, in this respect, right still today. Thank you.
Thank you very much for that lecture, Professor Kinter. If you're available, we, we have some time for questions. I'm sorry, I'm not available. <laughs> was it? Of course. What, what would it take to convince you? We have time for questions, uh, and they, I believe they can, um, well, certainly we'll start within the room, and perhaps we can hear questions virtually as well. And we have a microphone that will come around. I'd be grateful if you could use it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you, Professor. It was a very nice and um, informative lecture. I have a question about uh, race, as you have, um, you know, have, um, you explained today, was, has historically been seen along a white-black axis, yes. and how would you say, the, how would you position groups like Asian Americans or Latino Americans yes. um, <clears throat> along that axis, and where do you see their allegiances and their racial attitudes in particular going? Thank you. Sure, well, that's a great observation and question. Um, Myrdal was writing at a time when uh, the immigration policy was basically to turn away uh, people who wanted to come to the United States. And that changed uh, dramatically in 1965 when Lyndon Johnson opened the gates. Uh, and uh, we've had this surge of immigration since, uh, different than an earlier wave, uh, different in, in that it uh, is coming from people who with dark skin. And so this complicates the problem of race in American society in, in uh, interesting ways and in ways that Myrdal couldn't anticipate and shouldn't probably be held accountable for. But it, it certainly goes, it's, it's highly relevant to what I've been talking about today and, and I just set it aside um, because it is a, a, a hugely complicating and ramifying consideration. I'll only say that there are uh, two ways to think about that. One is to think about Asian American and Hispanic American populations as also thinking about white and black in America. And secondly, uh, to think about um, Asian American immigrants and uh, Latino immigrants as constituting um, another addition to the racial complexity of American society. And, uh, there are really good arguments which I've contributed to, I think, and, uh, and I endorse that make an argument that there's something exceptional and profound about black-white in the United States, and um, not to dismiss uh, the considerations of other kinds of what are thought of as other races, uh, um, but, that, uh, but that race in the terms that I've talked about it today, in black and white terms, and the, the, uh, the origins and uh, lingering consequences of American slavery sets race apart, sets black and white apart from these other kinds of considerations. So in due time, there'll be somebody else up here standing talking about those kinds of considerations because there's a, there's a very uh, intense and systematic attack upon those kinds of questions. Uh, just not by me. Other questions? Yes, in the front row here. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for your lecture. Um, I was interested in um, kind of what Proposal 2 brings up, which is that, at least in your research, it seems that the campaign itself intensified modern racism in Michigan, um, perhaps for some time after the campaign. And I'm just wondering about how you read the Trump campaign as if, is, is, was it capturing a racism that was already there or did yeah. it also help to intensify yeah. modern racism and, and resi resentment? Yeah. That's a great question also, thank you. Um, I think it. I think it did not increase the popularity of modern racism. I think uh, racism has been something that's been with us from the very beginning, and uh, we're predisposed in that direction. And uh, Trump's genius, even if it's inadvertent genius, was his ability to capitalize on it—that is, to activate it or to prime it 
It was present. He had a way of talking, and he had directed himself to certain targets in a way that was, it, it joined people's latent modern racism to the choice they were confronting. They, they were able to see Trump as someone who uh, was on their side on the racial divide. But he didn't create that. He just took advantage of it. He exploited it. The, the evidence about, uh, remember I put a graph on the board about the decline of biological racism. Um, if you ran a similar graph for modern racism, it's almost entirely flat across 45 years or so that we have measures for. There's some suggestion that um, Trump has had the consequence, if anything, of lowering modern racism, that especially white, well-educated Democrats seem to be more racially sympathetic than they were before in, I think, uh, repulsion to what Trump said and how he said it. But by and large, uh, modern racism has been as popular, it was as popular in 1972 as it is now. So Trump did not create this. You know, it's been present in our society. But he did uh, perhaps stumble onto in a very effective way of, of uh, activating it politically. And uh, much, part, much smarter and more adept politicians than Trump noticed this. And so the, you know, the struggle for the Republican Party now is partly a struggle about uh, what people are prepared to say and do in their campaigns with Trump's astonishing success as an exhibit. I'd like to know your thoughts on the uh, broadcasting issue. So prior to somewhere in the 1980s, news had to be objective. TV news, you had to say both sides of the story. Yeah. And then the FCC under Reagan decided, oh no, you can just go say whatever you want to say. So then you have people listening to the news of their choice, like I only get Fox's point of view. How do you think that affected the evolution of racism in the US? Uh, uh. It's a very interesting question and it's a very hard one, uh, partly because things are changing, not just that, but other things are changing simultaneously. So uh, it's not just Fox News, it is the availability of social media as taken seriously as news sources and the uh, loosening of ordinary constraints about what can be said. Um, so the, Back in the day, uh, people looked to news, and when they looked to news, they were paying attention to ABC, CBS, and NBC on their television sets, and that's, that was their principal source of news, and it was curated, and I wouldn't call it objective exactly, but it was middling. It was trying to generate and maintain a large, large mass audience. So that system is all gone, and I, my intuition is that that's not been a healthy development in American politics, uh, which I think you thought so too. Uh, but it's very hard to uh, say decisively, I think, what role that played in addition to other considerations that were changing at the same time. And that's what you should do is talk to Nick Valentino after we stop talking here and he'll be able to answer that question. Is that right, Nick? No, that's not right. <laughs> Oh. Thank you. We have time for one more question from, yes, here in the front. Thank you so much for uh, talking about the Republican convention. That was really insightful. Um, my question is about uh, Myrdal's prediction. Uh, apparently, I think you said that uh, he was over-optimistic about when um, biological racism would dwindle away. Yes. I'm curious as to um, your insights about why he was over-optimistic. Was yeah. it his perspective or did unexpected things happen? Yeah, um, it's, yeah I, it's very interesting, I think. I told you that it's a gigantic work. It's a thousand pages. It's uh, 250 pages of footnotes. I'm the only person who's read this. Um, and it's full of information about how 
deeply entrenched a system of racism was in the 1930s and 1940s. He spent a lot of time in the South, Muriel did. It, in some ways, it's a magnificent effort in collecting information almost for the first time about where blacks and whites stood, what their lives were like, and how profoundly different they were in all domains. I mean, he was an economist, so he starts there, but everywhere else, schooling, health, so-called justice, um, he was tremendously convincing about how deep the problem was. That's, you know, that's like 980 pages of that. And then he has this introduction where he says, it's bad, but it's going to get better, and it's going to get better soon. And, and so how can you put those two things together? And I think the right answer there is that um, he didn't look at the evidence and then say what he thought based on the evidence. These were two separate exercises, and the optimism was um, politically, political and strategic, that what he wanted to say to America. Remember, he was uh, very importantly involved in the creation of the welfare state in Sweden. Uh, he was uh, a social activist that way. He thought that uh, there, there was sort of this growing power of the federal government through the Great Depression into World War II, um, and that this could be a, a lever for real change. And he was trying to convince people, and he actually convinced a lot of people that it was time, that if you made decisive action now, things would get much better, much more quickly than you otherwise would have expected. But I think that came more out of a sense of him trying to make a political argument and not a social scientific one. Thank you. I'd now like to close our event. Um, before doing that, I note that there is a reception that will happen immediately after the lecture. And uh, before doing that, please join me in thanking our Henry Russell lecturer, Professor Donald Kinder. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.